Okay, thank you, Jenny. Uh, so for the benefit of some of our visitors, I'll just say a little bit about our panel. The process study model improvement panel's mission is to reduce uncertainties in the general circulation models used for climate variability prediction and climate change projections. Um, and so, as Jenny mentioned, in support of that mission, uh, we often uh, host webinars focused on, we, we review, prioritize, and coordinate U.S. scientific plans for and programmatic support of relevant process studies or field campaigns. Um, and so a lot of our webinars, we will be hearing about uh, recent field work that has been going on, but today um, we will be focusing a little bit more on some of the model improvement part of our panel. And um, the talks we'll be hearing today are also a prelude to a U.S. CLIVAR supported tropical process observing needs workshop that will be held May 24th through 26th of this year. So I'd like to take a chance to give a brief introduction to our two speakers. First, uh, we have Brandon Wolding. Um, Brandon is a research scientist at Ceres NOAA PSL in Boulder. Brandon received a Bachelor of Science degree in Oceanography from Hawaii Pacific University, a Master's in Applied Marine Science from the University of Cape Town, um, and then he later came back into graduate school at Colorado State University, where he earned a master's and PhD degrees in atmospheric science, working with Eric Maloney. Um, Eric, or sorry, Brandon focuses on process diagnostics and understanding of tropical convection and its coupling to the ocean, both in observations and models. He has also, uh, over the past uh, few years, served as co-chair of the MJO Symposium at the AMS annual meeting. So following Brandon's talk, we will hear from Jack Reeves Ayer. Uh, Jack uh, earned his bachelor's degree in astrophysics from the University of Cambridge in 2008. Uh, he then went to work uh, for a period at the UK Met office, first as a weather forecaster, then as a climate scientist. Uh, he also returned to graduate school after a period working uh, and in 2016, he earned his master's degree in hydrometeorology at the University of Arizona. And in 2020, he earned his PhD also in hydrometeorology at U of A, working with uh, Dr. Jubin Zhang. And in September of 2020, uh, Jack began a postdoctoral scholar position at the Cooperative Institute for Climate, Ocean, and Ecosystem Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. So uh, his talk today will actually focus on some of his PhD work. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it over to first Brandon, and then we'll hear from Jack. And I think, as Jenny said, we'll hold our questions for both until the end. Is that right, Jenny? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's all yours, Brandon. Okay, sounds good. Uh, my internet at the rental doesn't seem to be doing great today. So if I need to repeat anything, please uh, just go ahead and let me know. Okay, well, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to talk about thermodynamic convection coupling in observations, reanalysis, and models. Um, this is work done in collaboration with Juliana Diaz, George Colatis, and Maria Gaina from NOAA PSL, Scott Powell from Naval Postgraduate School, and Fayaz Ahmed and David Nealon from UCLA. So, Big picture motivation, why do we care about tropical clouds and their representation in models? Well, tropical clouds are very important. Uh, they're very important for weather, not only in the tropics, but because of their ability to teleconnect, important for weather in the extratropics. Uh, in fact, the tropics are the primary source of two week to two year predictability in the extratropics. So counterintuitively, if you're a water resource manager here on the West Coast, and you want an extended range forecast, the place you probably care most about in the world is the tropical West Pacific. Uh, tropical clouds are also very important for climate. They transport heat, moisture, and momentum, and they broker radiative transfer. Now, if you wanna understand and model tropical clouds, you need to understand and model the processes that drive their organization. Uh, this animation shows cloud brightness temperature, and then overlaid in the color contours are the same field uh, filtered for different wave types. So we've got the MJO and teal, equatorial Rossby waves in green, Kelvin waves in red. Um, and I just want you to note that these waves organize a considerable fraction of convective variability. Now, unfortunately, our models struggle to represent this type of variability. 
uh, which is crucial to, among other things, subseasonal to seasonal predictability. So uh, model inner comparison studies, process level studies, they've all pointed the finger at thermodynamic convection coupling as a potential culprit for why models seem to struggle with this type of variability. So the goal of this study is to develop process oriented diagnostics that can provide targeted actionable guidance to model developers. So thermodynamic convection coupling is a, a very complex process. Uh, so conceptually to simplify this, we're gonna consider this as three distinct steps or questions. Um, first, we're gonna ask, how does convection respond to its thermodynamic environment? Second, we're gonna ask, how does convection in turn cause its thermodynamic environment to evolve? Uh, and then finally, we're going to ask, how does this coupling process here, um, how do these feedbacks change as the characteristics of the cloud population change? So we're going to develop diagnostics that try to answer all three of these questions. Now, for our, our diagnostics, we need some simplified or reduced measure of our thermodynamic environment. Um, and the one that we've chosen in this study is called lower tropospheric plume buoyancy, or simply BL. Um, this is just the, uh, the hand wavy explanation is that it's a reductionist measure of convective instability, uh, which measures moisture and temperature stratification between two bulk layers, a boundary layer, which goes from the surface to 850 hectopascals and a lower free troposphere, which goes from 850 to 500 hectopascals. Um, so we're going to rearrange the terms of this bulk measure of convective instability to highlight different physical processes, such that our total lower tropospheric buoyancy or total BL is going to be equal to an undiluted buoyancy. Uh, this is some theoretical buoyancy of an unentraining plume. So just imagine a plume rising out of the boundary layer that doesn't mix at all with its surrounding environment. Um, so this term is only dependent on moisture and temperature in the boundary layer, and then the temperature of the overlying free troposphere. Now, from that, we're going to subtract a dilution term, and this is meant to represent the reduction of buoyancy due to entrainment here in this, this lower free troposphere in the second level. Um, so just the, the plume mixing with its surrounding environment. And this just depends on the saturation deficit, or you can think about this as the humidity in the second layer. So again, our total buoyancy equals some undiluted component minus a dilution component. Now, the diagnostics that I'm going to show uh, throughout the rest of the talk are going to be laid out like this. So I'm going to take a minute to explain this figure. So on the X and Y axes, we've got our two different uh, buoyancy terms. We've got undiluted buoyancy on the Y axis. So you can think about this as undiluted instability increasing upwards. And we've got our dilution term on the X axis. So you can think about this as the lower free troposphere becoming more moist as we go to the right. The contour lines so show lines of constant total buoyancy, which again is just the sum of these two components. So total buoyancy is going to increase as we go to the upper right-hand side of this figure as undiluted instability increases and the lower free troposphere moistens. Note that we can get uh, the same total buoyancy through different compositions of its subcomponents. So we can have high undiluted instability in a dry environment or a low undiluted instability in a moist environment, and it still gives us the same total buoyancy. It still falls on the same contour line. Now, the gray square in these plots is going to mark the mode of observations or the uh, mode of the PDF or where the system spends most of its time. Uh, and from theory, we know that this should correspond uh, more or less to um, a critical point or a phase transition from a non-convecting atmosphere here at low buoyancies to a convecting atmosphere here at higher buoyancies. So let's go ahead and overlay data on this plot and see what it looks like. We're gonna start by looking at reanalysis and then we're gonna look at observations. And specifically what I'm overlaying here are um, reanalysis thermodynamic fields are being used to compute our buoyancy terms. So our X and Y axes. And in the color shading, I'm overlaying observed trim precipitation on a log scale. So what we can see is that when buoyancy is very negative, uh, we have essentially no precipitation. And then as uh, buoyancy increases past some critical threshold, 
we get this rapid increase in precipitation with increasing buoyancy. Now the vectors show the temporal coevolution of the system. Um, specifically what they're showing is just the, the bin mean temporal center difference of our two buoyancy terms. So we're asking how, how does our thermodynamic environment tend to evolve with time? And we see that it tends to evolve in a cyclical fashion. Um, now, before we discuss what this means from a process level narrative, um, let's just take a look at, at what the cloud population is doing throughout this plot. And to do that, we look at trim 2A23 precipitation. Um, this is a product which takes the total precipitation rate, so that's the color shading in this plot, and breaks it down into percent contributions from shallow, convective, and stratiform precipitation types. So if you add up these three plots, you get 100% of the total precipitation rate, which we saw in the previous plot. So what you can see is down here in the lower left, when buoyancy is very negative and precipitation rates are low, we have predominantly shallow type precipitation, makes sense. Um, as precipitation rates start to increase here, we get more convective type precipitation. And then as precipitation rates reach their maximum and then start to decrease, we see more stratiform anvil type precipitation. So tracing the cyclical evolution, you're really tracing a transition from shallow to convective to stratiform precipitation. Um, and this is something that's you know, oftentimes referred to as a prototypical convective life cycle. Um, it's uh, a cycle that we see uh, in everything from the diurnal cycle to these different types of equatorial waves to even features of the general circulation like the Hadley and the Walker circulation. So, um, so we think it's important that models get this, this type of transition right. So now re returning, um, yeah, returning to our previous figure um, and uh, trying to add a process level narrative and what does this tell us from a model development standpoint? Well, uh, this would suggest that uh, ensemble average convection more or less responds to this simple bulk measure, uh, large scale measure of convective instability. Um, it would say that precipitation rate is more or less agnostic or doesn't really care about the specific composition of buoyancy, right? We uh, can have a high undiluted instability in a dry environment or a low undiluted instability in a moist environment. And it gives us roughly the same precipitation rate. Those lines of constant precipitation parallel the lines of constant buoyancy. It also tells us that precipitation rate is more or less agnostic to the characteristics of the cloud ensemble. We know that the, the cloud types are changing dramatically through this plot, but again, the only thing convection seems to care about is this kind of bulk measure of large scale convective instability, or to say that another way, it just cares about the thermodynamic environment. So this gives us a very kind of clear tractable way forward. Um, we can simply use moisture and temperature budgets to identify what processes are driving this uh, evolution of the thermodynamic environment. And that'll help us understand what uh, processes are driving the evolution of convection or convective variability. Now, where this becomes more complicated is when we look at observations. So today, I'm just going to show you the analysis of around 115,000 NOAA um, EGRA soundings from these six small tropical islands. Um, these soundings span 1970 to 2018. We have also looked at cosmic uh, GPS radio occultation profiles, and they show a similar story here. Um, so if we use these soundings and we plug it into that same diagnostic plot, uh, this is what we get. So in this plot, we're using the NOAA EGRA soundings to um, determine our buoyancy terms, our X and Y axes. And again, in color shading, we're overlaying that observed trim precipitation. Um, so we'll start by looking at the vectors here. And they tell the same general story that we saw before. They, they have this kind of clockwise uh, evolution, the cyclical evolution. But if we ask, how does convection respond to its thermodynamic environment, i.e., how does the color shading fall on this plot, uh, we see that's very different from what we saw in reanalysis. Instead of paralleling these uh, lines of constant buoyancy, uh, we see that it runs at roughly a 45 degree angle here. Now, what this is telling us is that observations and reanalysis 
do not agree on how the thermodynamic environment evolves, specifically in relationship to uh, observed precipitation. So first we're gonna talk about uh, specifically what observations and reanalysis disagree on. And then we're gonna talk about why that matters. So to look at what they disagree on, what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare uh, soundings and reanalysis thermodynamic profiles as we trace one of these uh, prototypical convective life cycles around here. So that's what I'm showing in this plot. Um, in the left-hand panels, I have specific humidity in color shading. In the right-hand panels, I have temperature in color shading and specific humidity overlaid in the contours um, for reference. Uh, on the top, we've got the eager soundings. In the middle, in this case, we're showing era five uh, thermodynamic profiles. Um, and, and on the bottom, we're showing the difference between the two or, or the disagreement. Um, these figures are vertical profiles. So we're looking at pressure on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we're just tracing one of those convective life cycles from shallow to convective to stratiform type precipitation. And what you can see is comparing soundings to reanalysis that they agree very well in the free troposphere. Uh, but once we start looking in, in the boundary layer, we see that they disagree on both the magnitude and the timing of moisture and temperature variations. Now, we believe that this is due to a lack of thermodynamic observations being assimilated within the boundary layer. And this creates a very large dependence on the assimilating model. Now, hey, Brent, I'm sorry, I think you're ahead. almost done, but a couple minutes to wrap up. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. This is my last plot here. Um, so to go back to, to why this matters. So what does this tell us from a process level narrative? How does this guide us as far as model development goes? Well, what it says is that uh, um, ensemble average convection is not responding to just these simple large scale measures of convective instability or that these large scale measures of convective instability are not um, fully assessing the capacity of the atmosphere to support deep convection. Um, now, in the paper that we're working on, we use a few lines of evidence to suggest that um, processes occurring on the subgrid scale are helping to maintain deep convection in otherwise unfavorable large-scale thermodynamic environments. So think about uh, subgrid scale variance and covariance within your thermodynamic fields or subgrid scale processes such as cold pools providing dynamic force. Um, but in summary, you know, observations and reanalysis differ systematically in their depictions of boundary layer moisture and temperature variations. Um, and these systematic differences fundamentally change how we perceive the relationship between ensemble average convection and its large scale thermodynamic environment. Now, in the context of the upcoming Clivar Tropical Pacific Observing Needs Workshop, um, you know, I think we can agree that understanding the thermodynamic evolution of the boundary layer is critical to understanding both convection and air-sea interactions. Those are two things I care very much about. Um, and it seems like we still have a ways to go in understanding exactly how and why the boundary layer evolves uh, the way it does. So um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thanks for your time and your attention. And I look forward to our discussion afterwards. All right. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so I'll ask everyone to hold your questions until after we hear from Jack. But um, yeah, this, this is great. And I think Jack's talk will be a very nice uh, natural follow on to Brandon. So go ahead, Jack. Great. Thank you. Can everyone see the. Uh, yes, green. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, yep. hi, everyone. My name is Jack Reeves. -Air. I'm currently a, a postdoc at. Um, Seacoast University of Washington, but this is work that was done as part of my dissertation research at the University of Arizona with my advisor, Shubin Zhang, and a collaborator at uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Kai Zhang. Um, so let me jump right in. I'm going to start with a fairly basic overview of the physics involved, um, which is to say that the the fluxes of heat and water and momentum at the ocean surface are controlled by really small scale atmospheric turbulence. Um, and that, that scale is far below the, the typical grid resolution of a numerical model. So numerical models rely on bulk flux algorithms to calculate the surface fluxes based on the bulk, large scale bulk quantities like the 
wind speed, air temperature and humidity in the atmosphere, and then the sea surface temperature and kind of optionally the surface current in the ocean. Um, so there are quite a lot of different algorithms out there and they're all um, empirical, basically, and tuned on a relatively small number of observations that, that have taken direct flux measurements and developed a parameterization based on that. And so lots of studies have compared the different algorithms in what I'll call idealized tests, which is with prescribed bulk variables. So you, you prescribe all these different variables and then see how the fluxes vary between different algorithms. Um, what I'm looking at here though is how sensitive a model can be to the different algorithms. And so here it gets more complicated because the, the, there are feedbacks between the fluxes and the bulk variables themselves. And so this kind of makes everything a bit more uh, complicated. And so the first question I'm trying to answer is how did the fluxes vary between algorithms when these feedbacks are included? Um, as well as the actual, the simple kind of flux to near surface bulk variable feedbacks that the, the changes can extend further into the model. So either higher into the atmosphere or deeper into the ocean too. And so we might see changes in precipitation clouds or the circulation of both the atmosphere and the ocean. And so the second question is what other aspects of model behavior are sensitive to the bulk algorithm choice? Um, and then finally, th this kind of builds from the, the that feedback idea of um, which feedbacks we include. So if we, if we use a atmosphere only model where we have a prescribed sea surface temperature, but the atmosphere variables can vary, we may end up with one answer, but a different answer in an ocean test where the SST can vary, but this time the atmosphere variables are prescribed. And then we could even do a couple tests where all the different bulk quantities can vary. And so each of those includes a different range of the feedbacks. And so the final question in this study is, um, is the sensitivity to the algorithm choice the same between atmosphere only and ocean only tests? And I should note, I've kind of grayed out the couple tests here because we didn't have the resources to do these yet. Maybe that'll be something we can look into in the future. Um, so quick, ultra quick summary of the um, study. We are using the Department of Energy's E3SM Energy Exascale Earth System model. Um, and we're, we're comparing these two types of tests. So the atmosphere tests and the ocean tests with three different algorithms. The one I'm referring to as control was used in the kind of version one E3SM um, simulations. And we also have the UA or University of Arizona algorithm and the core V3 algorithm. Um, and so that gives two, two different types of tests, three algorithms, six simulations in total. And we're gonna be comparing the, the um, answers from those. And in terms of how we do those comparisons, it's mostly going to be looking, comparing the model simulations. For some variables, I, I will show some um, comparisons against observations. For example, the precip and the radiation fields can be compared to some pretty robust observations. But for the fluxes themselves, I'm not going to um, compare, the, compare the model results to uh, global data sets, for example. And that's mostly because they are not really independent um, verification products because they rely on the same algorithms as we're testing. So they're not really an independent test. Um, all right, so let's jump into some um, results. So the, I could show hundreds of these kind of comparisons between different algorithms here, but I'll just I'll briefly describe this one and then highlight what the, the kind of overall pattern of the results. So this is a latent heat flux annual mean and each of these plots is the difference between the core and ua algorithms so on the left is the core atmosphere simulation minus the ua atmosphere simulation and on the right is the core ocean simulation minus the ua ocean simulation and the thing i want to highlight is that the patterns of sensitivity are different between the atmosphere tests and the ocean tests and basically the magnitudes as, as seen here, but across all the different types of fluxes, all the different pairs of algorithms, the magnitudes are larger in the atmosphere tests, and that's because the wind speeds can vary. Um, so when you fix the wind speed, you, you in, as in the ocean uh, simulations, you take away a pretty big source of the flux variation. Um, having said that, 
there are some um, regions that are consistently sensitive across in, in both the atmosphere and the ocean tests. So for example, in the heat fluxes, Western boundary currents and the tropics are pretty similar in the atmosphere and the ocean tests. And for momentum fluxes, the tropics, trade wind belts and Southern Ocean are all pretty um, consistent across atmosphere and ocean tests. Um, and another surprising fact is that despite those different um, patterns that we saw, the global mean sensitivity is pretty consistent between atmosphere and ocean tests. Uh, so for example, if we look on this top row, this is the latent heat flux, then the control has the largest magnitude and then UA and core are pretty similar. And then although in the second row, the, ocean, the, the numbers are pretty different from the first row, the, the, the pattern of control having the largest magnitude, then UA and core being pretty similar holds. So in the global mean, things are a bit more consistent than they are in the uh, spatial patterns. Uh, for the evaporation, this pattern doesn't quite hold. Um, and that's because the UA algorithm has a different formulation for the latent heat of vaporization. It allows a variable latent heat whereas the other two have a constant. And so that kind of changes the, you don't see the same pattern between latent heat flux and evaporation. And although that's not really crucial for the tests we've done, that would be a more important um, thing to bear in mind for coupling energy and water cycles in a um, coupled model. So that's just an interesting kind of uh, consequence for the future. Um, okay, so I'm doing time. Okay. So earlier I mentioned that that wind speed variation is, is one of the, the key uh, differences between the atmosphere and ocean tests. And here's an example of that from the Gulf Stream in the winter season, so December through February. Um, and this top panel here is showing how the latent heat flux magnitude varies by wind speed. So basically what we're seeing above about 12 meters per second, then the control algorithm has the larger magnitude followed by core and then UA is the lowest. Um, so in the ocean test, this is what's going on. When you, you keep the wind speeds the same, but the, the fluxes can still vary. Now in the atmosphere simulations, the actual distribution of the wind speeds also changes. So here control has the highest um, furthest right shifted wind speed distribution, then core is somewhere intermediate and UA has the lowest distribution. And so in the atmosphere test, you see both of these things going on and that they both tend to then increase, change the um, fluxes to a larger degree. Um, so I'm, I'm quickly, there are lots more details I could go into further through, throughout the atmosphere and ocean uh, model results, but I'm just going to kind of zip over a few uh, key results in how, how the fluxes then affect the whole atmosphere and whole ocean models. So in the um, atmosphere, the precipitation um, core has the lowest both bias and RMS error uh, comparing to GPCP observations. Um, and then UA and control are pretty similar. And the top of atmosphere net radiation, this time UA has the lowest bias and lowest RMS error. And this, this kind of extends to all sorts of different results. There's no, no single algorithm gives the best results across all different metrics. Um, and then on the right, this, this figure is showing uh, each panel is one kind of pair of differences. So this is the top one is UA minus control zonal wind speed. And we see that in the winter um, hemisphere, so the northern hemisphere on the right throughout each of these panels has some pretty sizable changes in the zonal wind speed distribution. So uh, shifts in the kind of core of the jet stream and, and uh, the exact speed there. So th this, these kind of results um, you know, are reflected in the other um, season in the other hemisphere too. Uh, so in the ocean, the some of the more interesting results we see are the ocean heat uptake is pretty strongly affected by this. So uh, this is a change over the course of a 10 year simulation. Um, the the the, unit, the numbers here are, I'm guessing, pretty meaningless to most people. But if these changes in 10 to the 22 joules are roughly comparable to the, the observed natural variability we see on decadal timescales. So that they, these are pretty significant um, differences in the rate of ocean heat uptake. Uh, this figure on the lower left is the um, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. 
And all three simulations have a pretty big bias that the AMOC is too low. Um, it kind of reduces over the course of the simulation. It should be up here about 17 or so. It's, it's kind of bias low. Um, but the, sim, the, the algorithm choice does make a little, not a huge difference, but a little bit of difference to that bias in general. Core has the, the lowest magnitude and therefore the biggest bias in the AMOC. Um, and then that plus some other ocean circulation changes also affect the uh, global meridional heat transport. So this is this right-hand panel. Um, so that the ocean is kind of transporting heat polewards um, in the, throughout the tropics and subtropics. Um, and again, it's, it tends to be biased a bit low. And this time it's the, the UA algorithm has the, kind of reduces the bias a, li a little bit. They're all still biased too low, but um, UA has kind of a bit of an impact on improving that bias. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna summarize now. I think I'm running out of time, but um, so it, yeah, to summarize the atmosphere tests result in larger magnitude changes than the ocean tests because the wind speed can vary. Um, but despite the tropics and Western boundary currents are consistently sensitive to the algorithm choice across both the atmosphere and ocean tests. Uh, lots of other aspects of the model behavior has changed. Um, so for example, the, the precip global radiation and atmospheric circulation in the atmosphere, and then the ocean heat uptake and meridional heat transport in the ocean. But no single algorithm performs best across all these metrics. Um, so I uh, have really zipped over a lot of these results, hoping to give a taste of all the different changes that occur. But if anyone's interested in more details, this has just been accepted uh, for publication in Frontiers of Marine Science. And that should be available, I think, within a few days. Um, so if anyone's interested, please let me know and I can provide that link. Um, and lots of acknowledgements, lots of people helped in the background with these simulations and interpretations. So at University of Arizona, uh, Department of Energy, and then um, I should also thank Thomas Tonazio and Chris Farrell for kind of upstream versions of the core um, algorithm. Um, and then finally, I wanted to leave up um, some next steps and recommendations. So probably this goes without saying, but having more resources to do longer and coupled atmosphere ocean simulations would be nice and really help to interpret some of these um, for example, to see if something like once you allow the atmosphere model um, changes to affect the ocean simulation as well, then maybe those changes in AMARC and meridional heat transport will be even bigger, or maybe they'll be different. But um, doing those coupled simulations would allow us to look at that. Um, another recommendation is a kind of a data set synthesis idea. So, as I mentioned, using the Global, pro global flux products out there is, is kind of difficult in this application because they have an algorithm baked in. So they're not an independent test. So somehow combining those with the very sparse direct covariance observations of the fluxes, having some kind of combination of those two that can help in this application will be a really uh, useful thing to have. Um, and then to help, this is a already an ongoing, you know, decades long effort, but having more direct covariance observations in undersampled regions and regimes um, would, would help to further develop bulk flux algorithms in the future. Um, so I'll stop there, leave this up, and hopefully have lots of time for questions. Thanks.